to chime in anytime here. Um, Ed was the one that actually found Richard and Miter Corporation for us today. So I'm hoping he can bail me out if I get stuck on some of this, although I should know. Um, <clears throat> Richard Preston is here with us today. He's the one with the really cool background. Um, he's with the Miter Corporation. We're going to talk about some fundamental principles of quantum computing. You may hear about it. Um, if you were on earlier, you heard quantum computing today might be like the internet in the early 90s or the big, huge cabinets of computers we had in the early days, um, but it's pushing forward. It has a lot of real use case. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there are early adopters pushing and learning and, and trying to refine the technology as it emerges. Um, we are going to take sort of a software engineering perspective today. So if you have any use case type questions, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat. I'll keep an eye on it. Or if you're if you're kind of a geeky nerd like me and you have um, software engineer questions too, you can put them in. Um, Richard is uh, the group lead in the network analytics department at MITRE Corporation. He's a graduate of Tufts University, received a BS in computer engineering. I love that, by the way, whenever you get a BS in anything. Um, and an MS in electrical engineering. After college, Richard worked on research and development projects spanning all kinds of technology areas, network security, machine learning, cloud and edge computing. This guy knows what's going on. So I'm really excited today. And um, Richard, I'm going to, you have some slides for us. I'm going to bring it over to you and then Ed and I will keep an eye on the chat. Thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, so, so yeah, so today um, my talk is around quantum computing from the software perspective. So as I mentioned earlier, for those of you that, that joined at the beginning, um, I'm not a, a quantum physicist, so I don't really have a, a big strong background in, in quantum mechanics um, and quantum physics, uh, but I'm a software engineer. So I've done some, uh, most of my work at MITRE is involved in writing software. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I started to become interested in this technology, quantum computing. And I was curious about how you actually write software to program quantum computers. Um, and uh, so I started learning about that, doing some research. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so um, I've been uh, last couple of years doing some, some research development as well as uh, trying to do some education as well. Um, we, we've created like a, a, a small course uh, in quantum computing software. We brought it to um, MIT. Uh, for high school students during the summer. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited about uh, evangelizing, <laughs> the, to use a, a, a popular word these days, um, this, this technology and uh, trying to cut through kind of the hype um, and try to help people understand what the technology actually is and what it can do and can't do. Um, um, so just the obligatory uh, a, a discussion of MITRE, uh, I'm, I'm from a company called MITRE that um, operates these things called federally funded research development centers. So basically what that means is that MITRE is this sort of trusted third party in between government and industry uh, where we can try to solve problems in a, in a very objective way um, in, the, in the public interest and the national interest. Um, so as you can imagine, quantum computing is, is a technology that is very much in the national interest, right? We're, we're competing uh, internationally on uh, to, to have the, the um, best quantum computing capabilities, um, and as well as uh, it's a, a technology that has uh, potential for uh, a lot of um, threats and opportunities that we want to be prepared for. Um, so I just want to start off, uh, just pose a question to you all. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, what what is quantum computing? Have you heard of quantum computing before? Um, what do you think about it? I just, I'm always interested and curious to know, you know, what what people have heard about quantum computing, what their um, what their notion of it is, and if you can maybe type in the chat or um, chat is easier. Uh, but and, uh, let me, I can grab the chat too. But um, you know, what do you know about quantum computing, if anything? So now, as you're, as you're typing, I'll show a couple pictures. Um, that you may may have seen. Um, this was the cryostat that I was talking about earlier. Um, so this is a, an IBM quantum computer. The actual chip is like down here, and all this is the refrigeration for for the quantum computer. Um, this is a, a Google, um, Google Google AI quantum chip. 
Um, and this was a chip that they used in, in 2019. They, um, maybe you saw the headline that they claimed quantum supremacy, this idea that um, you could solve a problem with quantum computers that is impossible to solve on a classical computer. Uh, this particular case uh, that was slightly, um, their thunder was stolen slightly because it turned out that the problem that they solved the quantum computer wasn't as difficult as they thought it was on a classical uh, or, or conventional computer, but, um, but it's still very interesting. And it's, it's interesting to, just to see what the chip looks like. It looks different than a, a, a traditional microchip. So cool. So yeah, okay, so there's some, some ideas. Um, crack a complex password in seconds, that, that, that could be. Um, something supposed to replace binary. I don't think it's repl gonna replace it. It's something new, so and we'll talk about that. Um, familiar with the concepts, having a clue how you would do anything uh, predictable with it. So yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so what really what um, the, the value and the, the exciting thing about quantum computing um, is, let's just start with what we do with computing today. So classical or conventional computers, um, really all of our computers that we use from our phone to our, our computers to our you know, chips in our cars and, and everywhere, we all use digital logic to work. Um, and this is the same principles. If you go back to the ENIAC, the first uh, electronic digital computers, it's, it's digital logic, right? Even going to the, the today's supercomputers, it's all the same fundamental principles. Nothing really has changed. Obviously we have made incredible strides and advances in what this, these, this technology can do. Um, you can, I mean, it's, it's a total miracle what has happened in the last um, you know, half century in, in computing, but the, the Principles are the same. I mean, it's the same as like the abacus, right? You could be, <laughs> it's like digital, digital computation. Um, so you mentioned binary, zeros and ones, like it's, it's all the same fundamental um, principles. And so what's really, really exciting about quantum computing is it's a, a totally new computing paradigm. It does not work in the same way at all. Um, so the, the main thing, if you don't, don't remember anything else from today, um, really, really important that you understand this, that quantum computing is not simply a fast conventional computer. This is what I think most people think, because um, you know that, that's reasonable to think because that's kind of how it's reported in the media. Um, but this is really not the case. Um, it's a new way of performing computation. And there are specific problems that quantum computing is more suited to and it'll solve specific problems better than um, conventional computers. So somebody mentioned, oh, can I run Office 365 on my quantum computer? No, you cannot, right? It's not intended for that. And it, there is no, I mean, I shouldn't make such a, such a strong claim, but it's almost 0% chance that you would ever do that um, because it's, it's just a different technology that, ha that works in a different way um, and that is suited for particular applications. Um, so in the next, let's say, uh, 25 minutes. Uh, I just want to go over some of the fundamental concepts behind quantum computing because um, I, I hope that that is most useful to you so you can kind of understand this technology. And I'll try to leave plenty of time for questions because I'm sure many of you have questions around like, um, you know, the, the industry and um, the what, what this can be used for, et cetera, et cetera. But I just want to start at the baseline of like, what are the fundamental concepts behind this? And hopefully a way that that you can, you can follow. Um, again, I'm not a quantum physicist, so I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to take this, take you through this very difficult math and, and physics. I'm just really trying to explain this in a way that, um, that, that you can understand. So if you, if you find yourself lost and not understanding it, which probably will happen because it's a diff, kind of an esoteric topic to get graphed at first, please ask questions and stop me. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, and I, I hopefully we'll send out the slides afterward too, um, so that if you, you have a chance to later to go back and, and look. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, is quantum information and what we talk about as information in a quantum context versus like a digital context. Um, so somebody mentioned bits and binary. Um, this, is, this is the fundamental unit information in a classical or a conventional computer. So we have bits. Bits can take on a discrete value of zero or one, off or on, false or true. Um, and uh, so, and, and on, like a, on a computer chip, a bit would be implemented with an electrical signal, for example, or a voltage. Um, and, and in software, I promise to take the software perspective on this, um, we refer to a single bit as a Boolean value, again, true or false. So this is like a, some Python code. Um, let's see, I think I, I can have a laser pointer so you can see it better. Um, 
So you can have a, a variable which stores a bit of information, essentially true or false. Um, and then based on the value of that bit, we could do something. So here it's like, if X is true, then we print out X is true. And, and I think th this is probably familiar to, to all of you. Um, so quantum, again, quantum is totally different. So the fundamental unit of information in quantum computing is a quantum state called a qubit or a quantum bit. That's, that's kind of an amalgamation of those. Um, so qubits can be a zero or a one, just like bits, but they can also be in a state which is like a combination of both zero and one. And the combination is really a, a good word because it's um, it's it's a, like a linear combination. It's it's a um, it's like an addition of the two states. If you look into the, the math, um, the word that people use here is superposition. I think that word is almost deliberately confusing because you don't use that word in either context. Um, but unfortunately, that is a conventional word, so I'll probably use that. Um, but uh, but it just means we can have zero and one at the same time. Um, and it it seems quite strange at first. Um, but I like to think of it in this way. So if you think about um, what like a, a data structure would look like that is a qubit, um, it's, it's essentially a, a data structure that has two attributes, um, or which, are, which are real numbers or like you could say floating point numbers. Um, and those two attributes are zeroness and oneness. So you can think of a qubit as like having some amount of zeroness, how zero it is, and some amount of oneness, how one it is. So you can imagine that a qubit that is zero, uh, is completely zero, it would have a zeroness value of one, and it would have a oneness value of zero. Um, did I say that right? So um, yeah, and and so and we won't get deeply into this, but um, of course, you know, qubits or quantum bits can have an implementation. So this is the information theory side of it, or the kind of the software side of it. Um, but at some level, at the hardware level, these qubits would be implemented in a real physical system. Um, so uh, we talked about superconducting uh, circuits. Um, that's uh, the most popular one right now. There's also um, trapped ion. Um, there's some interesting research on using photons. Um, so there's different implementations. Basically, you just need a system that um, behaves according to the um, laws of quantum mechanics. So, okay. Um, any any questions? So um, questions? Don't they have to add to one? Yes. So we'll get to that. Yes, definitely. Um, okay. So and, and just just again just to go a little deeper and, and stop me if I'm losing you. But um, when we have a qubit, the way that we express a qubit state, because again, we, it could be more than just zero and one. So we need a way of expressing this state, this complex state. And so the way that, that we do it is with a vector. I mentioned a qubit has two aspects to it. It has zeroness and oneness. So we could actually take that and plot it on a two-dimensional plane. And you get something that looks like this. So again, you have if a qubit is zero, and this is the funny notation that we use. You don't need to worry too much about that. Um, this just means this is a qubit that is a zero. So we have a zero, and this is the point one zero, because it is completely zero. The first coordinate is a one, meaning the zeroness is a one. So it's totally zero. And then the second coordinate is a zero, meaning it's not one at all. So this is this is just how we plot a qubit or, or represent a qubit. And the reason why this is useful is uh, Eldon asked an excellent question that uh, is very important, um, is that yes, the qubits can move around and they can have different values for their oneness and their zeroness, but there is a constraint and they need to be on this unit circle. So you have some A coordinate and some B coordinate, um, to be on this uh, on the on this plane, and a squared plus b squared equals one. So if you go back to um, you know algebra or whatever uh, pre-calculus, probably um, in high school, um, that is a circle. This is an equation of a circle. So the qubits have to live on this circle. That's the constraint. Uh, qubit is analog, yes. Although it's different than analog computing. 
So because analog computing is using, um, you know, a classical electrical signals um, and it, it have an analog value, but this is something fundamentally different. How many shades of zeroness one is available? Um, so as you know, there's not really a limit. I mean, I, I suppose there is a physical limit in terms of like um, the Heisenberg uncertainty, but um, you're just limited by the hardware of how accurate um, you can make these values. These are these are real numbers. Um, actually, they're complex numbers, but not important. Um, so these are these are complex numbers, and so um, you, you know whatever level of precision your instruments is capable are capable of producing, um, that's the level of precision that you can get. Okay. So this is the this is the really important thing to to understand about quantum information and qubits. So when a qubit is measured, um, so you this is also called an observation. Right? A qubit can be in this state; it can be anywhere on the on the circle. But when you actually measure the qubit, you only can measure a zero or a one. Those are the only two values that you're able to measure. And so the value that you end up measuring is probabilistic. So you have some probability that you're going to measure a zero, and you have some probability that you're going to measure a one. And those probabilities are based on these coordinates. These are also called amplitudes, these A and B. So depending on where we are on, the, on this circle, um, if I measure, then I'm going to get a value. Let's say I'm going to get zero, um, A squared, percentage of the time, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna get one B squared percentage of the time. And, and a student among you will notice this is why we have to have be on this circle because the probability of measuring a zero or a one is 100%, right? We're either measuring a zero or one, so the probability of measuring a zero plus the probability of measuring a one has to equal one or 100%. Qu questions in this? So one thing that, that's very difficult to wrap your head around, but is extremely important, is the act of measuring the qubit. Not only do you have this, this probabilistic measurement, but in fact, when you measure or observe the qubit, it actually does change its state. So if the qubit is in this superposition, which means it's, you know, it's in between 0 and 1, this, uh, you know, it's not 100% 0, it's not 100% 1, you can have some probability of measuring a zero or one. Um, and based on what you measure, the qubit is now in that state, 100%. So let's say I had this qubit here and I, I, I measured it and I measured, oops, and I measured a zero. Well, now I've changed the state because now I'm down here because I know the qubit is a zero. It's 100% zero. There's no oneness about it. So this is slightly strange, um, but this is just how quantum mechanics works. So, so the act of measuring it, it can change its state. Okay, um, let me go to the next slide. All right, so, um, that, so that's quantum information. So any, any questions on that? I think, I think we can move on. So the next really fundamental concept of, of quantum computing. So we have, we know how we store information, but how do we actually process it? Um, and, and you may have seen the term logic gates in a, in a classical context. Um, and this is again, fundamentally how we process all of our information today. Uh, we're using digital logic gates. Um, and so you can think of classical computation as a series of small decisions performed by these building blocks we call logic gates. So you have some signal that's coming in and you have a little, little dude here. This is a picture of a logic gate. <laughs> um, and, and he has some decision baked into him. Um, and so he looks at the signal coming in and he's gonna say, um, okay, my, my decision that I've been pre-programmed to make is that I'm gonna turn on B only when A is on. So he looks at A, oh, A is on. Okay, now I'm going to output an, an on for B. And then we have another guy, maybe this guy has pre-programmed to say, all right, turn on C only when B is off. Um, so you notice like this is a signal coming in and then they are um, generating a new signal 
and then putting in the output. Upon the active measurement is the extent of change consistently measurable. Um, but let's continue and then I, I might answer that question and then come back to it. Um, okay, so this is, this is classical. I think many of you probably knew this already. Um, and so here's, it, here's just a little deeper digital logic gates. The way we define them is with truth tables. This is not very important. If you, do, if you haven't seen this before, you don't need to really understand this deeply. But the point is that um, in, a, in a classical context, we're able to completely specify all of the outputs for each potential input. So if you have like a NOT gate, which is an inverter, it inverts the signal. We know that if the signal on the input is a zero, we know we're always going to output a one. And if the signal on the input is a one, we know we're always going to output a zero. And we can do this for all the possible inputs. We have multi-bit gates or two-bit gates. And you can see in the truth table, based on what the input is, what the output's going to be. And this is precisely how we define logic gates or, di or digital logic gates. And note that there's a limited number of, of one and two input digital logic gates. Not all of them are here. We have, I think, NOR and NAND and XNOR, but, but this, is, this is pretty much it. So again, quantum is totally different. So forget, you know, I just told you about classical and then forget everything I told you. Um, so quantum computing is a series of small modifications to the state of the quantum system. So that's kind of a, a mouthful. Um, but the way you could think about it is we have a qubit, which is coming in and then you are applying a gate to it. So rather than the gate being something that like sees a signal coming in and then makes a decision and then outputs a new signal, instead, the qubit is like coming down the conveyor belt and then you have a gate, a quantum gate, which is transforming it. It's doing an operation to that qubit um, and it's transforming it in a consistent predictable way. Um, and so you see like the, there's something called an X gate. So the qubit's coming down the conveyor belt and then we're gonna apply an X gate to it. But then it's the same qubit that's coming out the other side. So it's not like destroying the qubit and creating a new one or creating a new signal, which is what you kind of do in classical computing. Um, so this is something that's, that's very different. So the way that, that a quantum program works or a quantum algorithm is that you would set up your qubits um, and then you you know, throw them through the, through the gauntlet, which is all the, the gates that you've set up. And then you transform the system into a state that you, you want. And then maybe at the end, you likely you're gonna measure it um, and ideally get some useful information or useful result. Okay, questions? So, so one thing, remember again, so as you're doing this computation, um, you know, you, we can be, the qubits can be in that superposition. Uh, that I talked about that, you know, like half zero, half one kind of state. But remember, once you measure, that's all out the window. You're either a zero or a one. All right, I won't spend too much time going into the um, detail of the actual gates. Uh, I hope the slide may seem a little intimidating, um, but the, the takeaway here is that we have, just like in classical computing, we have quantum logic gates. Um, and we define quantum logic gates very differently than we define classical gates or digital gates. Um, and, and because we define them using a matrix. Um, and again, you know, if you, if, you, if you didn't get to linear algebra in college or you don't remember it, that's fine. You know, we're not, not gonna hold you to this. Um, but the point is that um, this is a, a, a matrix transformation of the qubit. So the qubit's in some state on this, on this circle. And then we are applying some uh, rotation to that qubit. So th we have an X gate. You can think of it, let's say not gate. It would, it would toggle between zero and one. So if you have a zero qubit and you apply X to it, the output, it would get a one. And if you have a one qubit, you apply X to it, now it's gonna be a zero. Um, and so essentially, it, it, if, you, if you do know the linear algebra, you can, you can see that th what this matrix does is it flips about this line. Um, and, um, and there's, a, there's a Hadamard gate. This is a, a very common gate that you can use to bring a qubit into and out of superposition. Um, so it, if you have a zero qubit and you apply H to it, it would go into this like 50% zero, 50% one state. That's kind of interesting. 
So how is the state modified without observing it and destroying the super, superposition? Um, this is a very good question. And so um, it, it's, it's uh, very difficult. <laughs> Um, so uh, that's a kind of a question of the, the hardware, um, but um, you know, basically you have some control signal uh, that you are um, you have programmed that would modify the quantum state in a way that you approve of. Um, so just like you know, you have you have these you know transistors that are it's basically a, a voltage controlled switch, um, and so. You'd have a um, some, you know, in, in many cases, a superconducting um, qubit, uh, and you would apply some control signal to that that would transform it in the way that you expect. And and but it's not it's, so they're distinct from measurement. You don't get you don't get any information out by applying a gate. Um, Okay, so so at this point, I think um, Eldon, it's probably you were you were asking like, okay, so well, what good is this, All right? I can I can uh, set up a, a qubit that's in like fifty percent zero, fifty percent one. Um, this is just a glorified coin flipping machine. What, this is totally useless. Um, and you would be right, but um, there is another principle that is extremely fundamental to both quantum mechanics and to quantum computing. Um, which um, allows you to combine the states of multiple qubits um, and then get some control logic. So um, here's, a, here's a kind of a, a quiz or a question. <clears throat> so here's some, some classical software. And the question is, how would you translate this into a quantum program? And I know we haven't talked about any quantum programming. There's some exercises at the end of the slides you could do later. Um, <clears throat> so not, not <clears throat> syntax is not important, but um, so you have two values that you're saying, okay, if A is a true, then we're going to toggle B. If you're not familiar with the Python, this is what this does. And so we have some control logic. We're saying conditional on some state or some value, we're doing something. So the way that you, you might think to put this into software, this is Q-sharp code, um, is, well, you, you'd allocate some qubits. This is what this use statement does. So all this means is I have some qubits I can use. Um, and then you could say, OK, well, I want to test if A is a 1 or is a true. And then based on that, then I'm going to toggle B. So I'm going to apply X to B. So this is a perfectly reasonable uh, thing to do. Um, does anybody see any any problem with this? So uh, Eldon was alluding to it. So, you know, how do you do stuff without observing it and destroying the superposition? So here I've measured it. I measured the qubit, and this destroys any superposition that that qubit was in. So in this case, it doesn't really matter because it's not in a superposition. It's just a zero. Um, but like you can imagine, in the middle of a quantum algorithm, you're using these uh, super superposition states, these complex states, for to do useful computation. And if you destroy that by measuring it, then now you're sad. You don't get to um, you know reap the benefits of your your amazing quantum algorithm. Um, so this is this is not what we do. Um, but instead, um, we are um, we use something called quantum entanglement. And again, this is another word that is like very very Fear striking. <laughs> it's, it's like um, entanglement. It seems like something out of Star Trek. Um, it's actually, you know, there there is is some very very cosmic interesting implications of of entanglement. But I think fundamentally, it's not that strange of a principle. Um, so really, when when multiple qubits interact, we see that their states can become dependent on each other. And I'll tell you, kind of give you an example of of how that works. So I talked about we had a one qubit system before. You know, we had a qubit that could be on the circle. Um, it could be zero or one or some combination of both. But you can have more than one qubit in the quantum computer. So you could have a two qubit system, for example. And the way we think about these systems is in terms of their possible measurement outcomes. So we have two qubits, and we measure both qubits. We could either have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. So we can have be anywhere on this grid. 
Um, and in fact, during computation, again, the system can be in a superposition of these, these states. They can be, you know, some amount of zero zero-ness, some amount of zero one-ness, some amount of one zero-ness, some amount of one one-ness. It scales to, to multiple qubits, not just with one single qubit. Um, but now take a look at the state. You won't be able to read this state unless you've seen it before. I'll tell you what it means. Um, this is a state where um, you have some amount of zero zero-ness and some amount of one one-ness. So it, it's based on the probabilities of the measurement outcomes. We're either going to measure zero zero or one one. And how likely are we to? Well, we look at the amplitude, the coefficient. And so one over root two squared is one half. So even though the state looks really weird, all it's saying is that when we measure this, there's a 50% chance we're going to get a zero zero, and there's a 50% chance we're going to get a one one. But those are the only two possible outcomes. So this is actually very interesting because when we measure it, either both qubits will be a zero or they both will be a one with 50% probability. We're never going to get a one zero or a zero one. And so what we see is that the two qubits are entangled because they cannot be separated into two independent states. In other words, if I measure one of the qubits and I get a zero, well, now I know for sure what the other qubit is. It's going to be a zero all 100% of the time. And so I can't, I can't take these two apart and, and say they're, they're totally independent, right? So once I measure one of them, that immediately tells me what the other one is. That's really all entanglement is. So it's, it's actually at, at, a, at a conceptual math level, um, software level, it's not that weird. Um, it gets a little weird when you talk about like, well, technically I could take these two qubits and put one on the other side of the universe and you'd still have this pattern where if I measured this one close to me and I get a zero, well, now I know what the other one is. Um, so that, that's slightly weird because it seems like you're, you're impacting the state of the, the other qubits. Um, but really the way that you think about it is that you're, you're impacting the state of the two qubit system. But anyway, that, that's very technical. So um, if you ask me questions about that, I could get into it more, but um, it's a, yes. Um, so could the, yes, could they be equally entangled at 50% zero one, 50% one zero? Absolutely. So this is a, just a different state. Um, so you could have a, you could imagine a state that is like one over root two, zero one plus one zero. Um, and these are, these are actually special states. These are called the Bell states. You may have, I don't know if you may have heard of them, um, but they're just very interesting because they're very clear examples of entanglement. Um, is the software language used Python? Yeah, so there, there are lots of uh, quantum computing, quantum software frameworks out there. Um, the one that uh, we probably, we won't get into the coding examples uh, um, today, we just don't have the time, but um, if, you, if you take a look later, um, you'll see it's all Q-sharp which is Microsoft's programming language for quantum computing. Um, and, uh, but there's others, really popular one is IBM's one, it's called Qiskit, um, which is Python based. So you kind of, it's like a, you import a library in Python and, um, and you go from there, so. All right, so, so just to close the loop on quantum logic gates. So, cause I told you about entanglement, but how do we actually use this to do logic? So if you think back to what we were trying to do earlier, we're saying, okay, well, I want to be able to do something based on the value of a qubit, but I don't want to have to measure it to do that. So this is where the concept of multi-qubit gates comes in. So we can use multi-qubit gates to produce these entangled states that, that are, are useful to us. Um, so this is a, an example of a multi-qubit gate. It's called C0. And all it does, very simply, is applies x to the target qubit if the control qubit is a 1. So this is exactly what we were looking for earlier. You know, if a toggle b, this is, this is how you'd implement it a quantum computer. So I haven't showed you a quantum circuit diagram yet. This is a way that we, um, we depict quantum programs, basically, um, visually. Uh, and so you, you could see the qubits are represented with lines going through. Because remember I mentioned like the way that quantum circuit works or quantum computing works is like it's the qubits going down the assembly line and the gates are being applied to them as they go along. So we have these through lines, which are the qubits in the circuit. And then you have the gates are like boxes and then 
specifically X, you have this, this circle thing. And a control is a, a black dot. So here's an example of a, a quantum circuit. And you can see in this one, we start out as zero. We pretty much always are going to start out the qubits being as zero. And then in the first qubit, we apply an H gate to it. And I'm, I mentioned the H gate is just a gate that we typically use to put a qubit into superposition. So now we have the qubit in a superposition. That's what the plus means. And now we apply a controlled x. And so this is this becomes very, very interesting. And, and I'm hoping you can you can appreciate this because it's, it's quite fascinating. So this qubit, before it goes through this, this two qubit gate, is like 50% 0 and 50% 1. Now we go through this, this gate. And the output is a two qubit system that's 50% 0, 0 and 50% 1, 1. Well, why is that? If you remember what I said about what the CNOT gate does is it applies x to the target qubit if the control is a 1. But the control is both 0 and 1. So this is where we go like down a branching path. And we say, OK, in the universe where the control qubit is a 0, it, nothing happens. So the target qubit stays as a 0. So we're 0, 0. Both qubits are 0. In the other branch, we, where it, the control qubit is a 1, we do apply this x gate. And so both the control qubit and the target qubit are going to be a 1. So again, the, the way you could, you could think about this is if the control qubit is a 1, the target was flipped. And if it was a 0, it wasn't flipped. So either they're both 0 or they're both 1. This is a way that we can produce this entangled states. So this is actually quite cosmic, because now what we see is we can do computation on all the different branches at once. And this is the power of quantum computing. Because if you can have a, uh, you can set up a, a state, which is like all the different possible input values. And then we can set up all these gates that the qubits are going through then we can apply the gates. And really what happens is you could think of it like the gates are applied to all the different branches at once. This is what's known as quantum parallelism. And this is where you get that exponential speed up for specific problems um, in quantum computing. Now, the reason why it's only for specific problems is because at the end of the game, you have to actually measure and you only get one output. You don't get all of them. So the name of the game is you want to use quantum parallelism to, um, you know, to, to do all this computation at once. And then you need to have some interesting way or clever way of combining that again to give you some information that you can use. Any, any questions on that? OK. So the, the, the last concept, which I think I'll skip, um, is is called interference. And um, I'll just show you this slide so you understand that you know you connect it to other concepts in engineering that you probably have seen. Um, there's this idea that signals um, can with the same frequency will interfere with each other based on their phase, um, which is kind of like if you if you again going back to pre-calculus, um, if you have like a sine wave, um, the phase is where the, the in the in the pattern it starts. So um, if, they, if you have two sine waves and they start at the same spot and you're adding the signals together, then they will constructively interfere. This is, so this is like a hearing aid. You're, you're kind of amplifying the frequencies that you want to hear better. And then if you have um, the opposite phase, uh, in other words, like this one starts in the middle, um, then they will destructively interfere. And this is like how noise canceling headphone, headphones works. So this is a concept in quantum computing, and this is a way that we can um, com you know, combine that information. I mentioned the quantum parallelism that's like branching out, and then we can use interference to uh, branch back, basically, and, and get the information that we want. Um, this concept is a little bit harder in terms of the math to, to go through, um, so I think we'll skip it. 
because uh, we're running low on time and I want to make sure to get questions. Um, but it's just that's the, those are the three really if you understand uh, uh, superposition entanglement and interference that's it like that's the fundamentals of quantum computing so you're all now you know, honorary quantum computing experts. Um, our computation is done by combining individual primitive gates. Yes, exactly. The gates are the building blocks. So you, um, just like in classical computing, um, you know, you'd build like you know you build you build an ALU or, or arithmetic logic, logic unit or even a CPU. Like the entire CPU, you go any level you want. Like it's amazing what we are able to do with classical computing. We have these massive computing systems, but at a fundamental level, they're built out of tiny gates. That's all it is. And it's the same thing with quantum computing. Um, so you would build a quantum algorithm um, uh, out of quantum gates. Or let's say you would implement a quantum algorithm. You would, uh, you would write a software program that implements a quantum algorithm out of quantum gates. One true example of problem solving. Yes. So let me, let me go, let me skip over this. Um, and just, uh, I, I have a section on quantum algorithms. I, I don't think I want to like, go deeply into any given quantum algorithm and like, um, cause that would, I think take more time than we have. Um, but just generally quantum algorithms use these concepts of superposition entanglement interference to process information in clever ways. And this has applications or potential applications in a lot of areas. So um, cryptography and cybersecurity is a, is a very big one. This is more on the threat side. Um, so as you, you may have heard, um, there's this quantum algorithm um, called Shor's algorithm, uh, which is really the, one of the most compelling quantum algorithms that, that we have um, in terms of its uh, difference in, in what you could do with a quantum computer versus a, a classical computer. Um, and essentially, um, it, it breaks the security uh, assumptions of the public key crypto systems that we use today for security, for, uh, for encryption. Um, so, like when you go to YouTube and you get you get HTTPS and you see the little green uh, lock, uh, that algorithm that that is used to secure that um, that system is broken by quantum computers. Well, we're not we're not there yet. Right? We, we need we need better quantum computing hardware. Um, but at some points, right, it's it's theoretically proven that um, we can use a quantum computer to break this. And in fact, you can write a quantum software program today that would do it if you only had the, the quantum hardware <laughs> that could actually run it um, on, on a sufficient scale. Um, and, and, and so like basically the, the way this, you know, to, to get into the mechanics of it, um, you, in order to like break this with a conventional or classical computer, you basically need to brute force attack, which means like you try all the different keys until you get one that fits the lock. But a quantum computer does not need to do that. A quantum computer can basically find the key directly. So I think Richard gets to that concept you mentioned, the quantum parallelism. Yes, exactly. And this is exactly how, how it does it, right? So at a very high level, um, what Shor's algorithm does is it, it kind of, it tries all the keys at once. And basically you're in a superposition of all of these. Um, and then it uses a very sophisticated um, and difficult to understand. I, I probably couldn't explain it to you, even if you asked me to. Um, uh, a process, including uh, something called a quantum Fourier transform, um, to find the pattern um, and and kind of uh, uh, combine, recombine that information, and to finally uh, allow you to find that the key. So and, and so and and that's just one. I mean, th so there's there's other um, algorithms. One algorithm that's very interesting is called Grover's algorithm, um, which is is not quite as drastic. So so uh, you know, with Shor's algorithm, it goes from a pr an exponential problem to what we would say a linear problem. So if you have like a a twenty forty eight bit key, and a on a classical computer, it would take you two to the twenty forty eight time steps, which is like more atoms in the universe, right? Um, so well, that's probably way too large a key size. People don't use the two, 256 bit key, right? It's still, it's still ridiculous amount. Um, but on a, a quantum computer, it would take you like on the order of, you know, however big the key size is like 256, right? So it's a, it's a totally game changer. Um, there's other algorithms like Grover's algorithm, which is just like a square root. So if you have, um, uh, uh, and, and Grover's algorithm is used for is to um, search any arbitrary 
space. Um, it's, you can think of it like a database search. So if you have um, some, some information or you have, let's say, um, a, a, a different uh, cryptographic algorithm, like a hash function um, or a symmetric key algorithm, if, if, you, if any of these words don't make sense to you, that's fine. Um, but the point is that, uh, you know, if, if, if you have some, um, a, a good example is like a password. So if you're trying to crack somebody's password, um, then it would you'd have to just basically brute force it. You have to try all the different passwords. Uh, but with Grover's algorithm, you can try all the passwords at once, but the information you get out is not complete, and so you have to like do it over and over again to kind of amplify. You kind of you kind of slowly grab you know grope towards the right password, um, and so it's it's still much better than a classical, but it's square root. So if it would take you, you know, if it would take you uh, uh, a million times you know, steps with the um, classical computer, it would take you what is that uh, a thousand on um, on a on a computer. I think Richard, earlier, if you could say a few words about simulation, because that's another really interesting, maybe more approachable for folks too yes. around, you know, game theory and economics and some of those areas. Yeah, and and I think with simulation, I mean, the the biggest. Uh, aspects and th this is really the the original um, uh, idea of that Richard Feynman conceptualized quantum computing was that um, well you know we we want to be able to study these quantum systems and quantum phenomena um, so we need some computer that could accurately simulate it um, and if if you think about um, like how how you simulate a quantum computer on a classical computer it's very difficult. Um, you, you essentially need, um, because, because in order to represent each of the possible states that you could be in, right, I mentioned you could be zero, zero, you could be zero, one, you could be one, zero, zero. And so every single qubit you add, it doubles the amount of memory that you need to store all the state of the, of the quantum computer um, or the, the simulated quantum computer. Um, so this is why you can't just simulate a quantum computer on a classical computer and call it a day. Right. We need actual real quantum computers that are, are have qubits that are physically, um, you know, operating on these, these principles of quantum mechanics. Um, and, and so if you were to, if you need to simulate, like do physics or, or chemistry or, or biology simulations that of, of systems that obey the laws of quantum mechanics, um, you would want to use a quantum computer to do that because it's just much more natural. Um, so that, that's really, I think, the, the main thing, but um, you know, there's a lot of research in you know using quantum computers and machine learning to accelerate machine learning um, algorithms and applications, um, optimization problems, um, data and image processing, and really again, it, there's there's a lot of unknown here because again, it's this totally new computing paradigm. Um, so who knows what will happen when people start thinking in terms of quantum computing um, because it's, it's a, just a new way of, of doing information processing. Um, and so I, maybe you all had this experience. When I first started, when I first learned to program it to code, I totally changed um, the way I think because it's, it's new. this is an amazing tool um, that helps you organize your thoughts in a specific way. Um, and and it, it really, I mean, it's not just that you are uh, programming the computer. I mean, the computer is, is changing the way you think. It's pro almost programming you to think a certain way. And so I think as people start to get into quantum computing more and more, I really expect that um, this will help us to, to um, have new ways of thinking about the, the world and the universe and solving problems. So, so I, think, I think we'll stop there because um, we only have a few minutes left. I'll put my, um, my contact slide up and just, you know, uh, interested in answering any more questions, I, I can stay. I, you all probably have to go at nine, many of you, but I can stay for as long. Um, and I think, I don't know if Dale, you were gonna send out the slides. Um, feel free to, I think I think I gave you the PDF version. Um, so feel free to send that out to people because there's some coding exercises in the in the appendix that people might be interested in. This is yeah. sufficiently large. I'm oh, sorry, good. I'll get a copy to Bert. Bert will get them out. Cool, great. Um, <laughs> To, to, do any quantum algorithms use feedback? Yeah, I, I would say there's a, there's a way there's a way in which you could talk, think about it as feedback. Um, like for example, I mentioned Grover's algorithm. So the way algorithm like Grover, Grover's algorithm works is it tries it it basically like I said it kind of 
gropes closer and closer to the answer. And so you're doing, you have this like set of, of quantum operations that you're running. Um, and basically what it does is it, is it boosts the probability of, a, of the state that you're looking for just a little bit. And so you have to like run it through over and over again. So you're basically taking the output of the previous step and putting it in the input of the, the, um, the next step uh, and you're doing it over and over again. So, uh, so yeah, deficiently large key come safe from quantum discovery uh, in some cases. So for, for public key cryptography, no. There's uh, for, if you're using RSA, um, you're, you're basically, if you're basically using any of the standards that we use today that are based on um, integer factorization and uh, elliptic curve um, cryptography or like, like the discrete log problem, those are totally broken by um, quantum computing. And so right now, um, this National Institute of Standards Technology is um, conducting a, a competition to get the next generation of cryptographic algorithms that would be secure against quantum computers. Um, and this is known as post-quantum cryptography. That's what the field is called. Um, but that's just for this particular type of encryption, um, which there's other types of encryption um, like symmetric key encryption, like AES, if you've heard of that, um, that is not vulnerable in the same way. And you can sufficiently protect against a quantum computer by simply doubling the key size. And same thing with like cryptographic hash functions or password, password hashers, things like that. Um, so it's a little bit nuanced, um, but yeah. And then example of practical applications. So, so I would say the, the holy grail, and I, I know people are, are dropping, the thing that we're waiting for to, to be able to see, um, for to see if if there's you know this ha has is going to take off, um, is this notion of quantum advantage, and what quantum advantage? I mean, you probably heard of quantum supremacy, but that's really not as interesting. It's quantum advantage that's really interesting, and all that is saying is that for some problem or some application, if you if you integrate quantum computing into that solution, um, you get a significant advantage over somebody who's not doing that. Um, and so th this is, of course, a very you know, theoretically very possible. Um, and, and, you know, I mentioned Shor's algorithm, Grover's algorithm, all these various things. Um, but we just don't have the quantum hardware capability yet in order to be able to do that. And really what we need is um, to, it's not just more qubits, uh, although we do need that. We need a lower error rate. As you can imagine, these are very, uh, very um, sensitive systems. And so um, like just measuring it changes the state, right? So um, you, like you need to get out all the noise. Uh, and if you have a, a qubit that's in some state and it interacts with the universe, um, that state will change. And so now your, your quantum algorithm is busted. Um, and so what we, what we need is a low enough error rate to employ error correction uh, codes and, and, and systems um, that would correct any errors that get introduced, just like we do in classical computers. Um, but the problem is the error rate is so high right now that the overhead introduced by employing error correction would introduce more errors than it would fix. <laughs> so that's really, what, so, and, and, and I think we're maybe, you know, five to 15 years away from that. So, so maybe maybe say a decade, um, and then we can really, but 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 really just look out for quantum advantage and for fully air corrected qubits. Um, that's really when this technology has uh, the potential to really disrupt the uh, industry in the real world. Of course, in quantum computing, would offer again IEEE. Um, I, I I I hope so. Um, yeah. Um, so. I, Yes, um, I, I don't know when um, we're, I'm, I'm gonna be uh, doing the course again with um, this MIT program for high school students this summer. Um, so I probably will be focused on that. Um, but, but yeah, we'll definitely at some point go back to IEEE. Um, and then if you're interested in, in this, um, like reach out to me um, and we can, you know, there's also a shorter version, like I kind of just gave it today. Um, this is a shorter version of, of this, of the course that can be um, easier to, you know, to do, right? We don't have, it doesn't have to be like a, a multi-week thing. Um, so yeah, heard someone claim human brain works on quantum computing principles. 
I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer that question. I think um, the universe works in quantum computing principles. So the brain is part of the universe. So maybe that's what they meant. Um, are you, as a result of quantum computing, could be used to do evil? Um, just the same. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, any technology could be used for good or for evil. Uh, the quantum computing and quantum information science community is very open. So you notice that like a lot of the, even even you know companies like IBM and Microsoft, which traditionally have been much more closed and proprietary, um, they're opening up all of their stuff um, to, to the public, which is really fantastic. And, and so um, I, I think the, I think the danger of, of quantum computing we used to do evil, I mean, uh, again, it's, it's, it's like you can use computers, classical computers to do evil, but does that mean we should not try to improve our, our classical computers? Um, well, no, I mean, we, we just wanna try to use them for good um, and, and stop the, the evil that's happening. Um, but I, that's probably not a great answer to that question. I, I have to think about that more. Uh, Human brain, we do pattern matching quickly and well compared to how it's done using class. Yeah, but it's it's really unbelievable what can be done with deep learning. If if um, I just saw some video on um, uh, generating images from text, so like you put in any phrase, like oh I want to I want a dolphin that in a spacesuit that's floating over Earth, and then it'll like generate a beautiful image for you. That's like totally novel. So it's, it's really mind boggling what could be done with machine learning, but that's a totally different topic. But, um, and, and, it, and it can recognize patterns pretty, pretty well. Okay, so we're, we're definitely over. So I don't, I wanna make sure to um, not keep anybody, um, but I could stay, you know, if people have more questions. I think this is a good place to uh, wrap it up for sure. Um, I want to say this was a very humbling presentation. <laughs> um, I got like 90% of it. Um, I, I was just fascinated by, I'm still getting over like when I move the mouse, there's a bunch of zeros and ones happening that like make things happen on my computer. I'm still getting my brain around that. Um, this in that, that picture, <clears throat> excuse me. It looked like a chandelier, that cryogenic, cooling yeah thing. the cryostat like, isn't that it's such right a cool of, like an alien movie. picture yeah yeah that's i like, mean I, ibm obviously loves to share it share this picture and give it to journalists because it's such, such a such a really cool picture <laughs> yeah this is this is really cool i you you're like obviously like super expert on this topic and we pre i know you're you're busy and and this is your business i really appreciate you taking the time to present this to us and um this is great. So thank you well, again. Well, thank you. I'm mean, seriously, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm passionate about this technology. And, and frankly, I mean, a part of my job, I think, should be to um, try to um, share, share what we, we've learned um, and not just work in a, in a, in a box, in a silo. Um, and so, you know, this is a really cool topic. And I think that we're going to need as, I mean, I know I put a little <laughs> bit of cold water on the, on the high <laughs> saying, you know, we're, we're 10 years away from, from, error corrected quantum computers but um like we will pretty soon need um a, an ecosystem of of quantum engineers right um it's not going to be just the quantum phd physicists that are, are going to be needing to do this like if you think about um you know once once computers exploded uh, now we needed all these software coders to actually program them and use them and, and integrate them into their solutions and so I, th I believe the same thing will happen with um, quantum computing so we'll we'll, ha we'll need like quantum software engineers, uh, which is a field that doesn't really exist today, but we're kind of hoping to make it, build it. You're exactly right, Richard. Yeah. I've heard the historical stories, others can comment about recruiting, basically just taking college graduates in the 60s that had no experience and turning, turning them into programmers. So yeah, we'll see yes. that kind of thing, whether it's a decade out or how long, it's, it's, as I say, still pretty hard to predict the future. Yes, mm -hmm. it's always difficult to predict the future, but I mean, there's so much investment so that the, right. if you follow the money um, that that can help to predict uh, there's, there's like mm. billions and billions of dollars at every level you know at at, at the federal government at, at massive corporations um and at universities and all over the place so um people believe it's it's a thing um they everyone could be wrong but uh everyone has been wrong 
before on many things, um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, more likely than not, we'll, we'll get there. So do you actually get to work on a quantum computer? Um, so I, I, most of my work focuses more on the, on the <laughs> software aspects. So as I mentioned, like the, the capabilities of quantum computers today are, are somewhat limited. Um, and in fact, we don't really even have like uh, uh, the, the presentation today focused on an idea of a qubit that is kind of idealized. So there's no error. Um, but that is not like, you cannot assume that with today's quantum computer. So you have to like think about the error. Um, we, we, we talk about this distinction of physical qubits versus logical qubits. So a physical qubit would be subject to noise. And so you need to account for that in your quantum algorithm. Eventually you wanna be able to not have to account for it. You can just treat all the qubits like they're, um, they're ideal and they're logical qubits. They may be made up of many physical qubits that are using some error correction schemes to, to produce that. Um, but anyway, all that to say that like, I can't run Shor's algorithm and break RSA encryption today. So, but what I can do is I can write a quantum software program that would do that on a future quantum computer. <laughs> Not only can I do that, I can simulate it and test it with a, with a small input size, validate its correctness. I can estimate the quantum computer resources that would be required to run the program very precisely. So I can say, okay, this is how many qubits I would need. This is the gate depth, you know, the number of quantum gates that it's gonna need to go through. So basically the amount of time that I need to like not have any errors. Um, and so you can create, you can um, start building almost like an arsenal of, of implementations of quantum algorithms or applying quantum algorithms to specific problems or specific use cases that you then would use in the future. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't tend to um, spend a lot of time like running on quantum computers, but I certainly have and, and can. The, um, the, if you're interested in running on a quantum computer, IBM is the way to go because they have a, um, a service where you can sign up for free, get a free account, um, and you can submit a job to their quantum computers at a very small scale, like five qubits or whatever. I, I don't know um, what the maximum is that's available to the public um, now. It was five qubits, they might have increased it. But anyway, so you, you can write your quantum program and you can hit go, and then it'll send it off to the cloud, and they will actually run your quantum program on their quantum computer and give you the answer, give you the result, um, which is amazing. It's really cool. So it feels, it feels really cool to be able to do that. But, but how useful is that today? Not super useful, but it's useful because you can learn about it and you can start um, to, to get, um, yeah, start to understand the technology and um, practice how to, to um, use it for, you know, once we have a larger scale systems. Cool. All right. Amazing. Um, Bert, you want to take us to the finish line here? Thank you again, Thanks, Richard. That was that was awesome, and thank you for the great questions today. Um, yeah, a lot of great, great lots questions. of great questions today. Thanks, Dale. Uh, Richard, thanks very much. Um, I I too am very very humbled. Um, uh, I I feel like I understood it and didn't understand it at the same time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That that's typically yeah. I think I think it was uh, was it Feynman or somebody who's saying like. If you think you understand quantum mechanics, then that's how you know you don't understand quantum mechanics. 